Good morning. Today we're going to be over in Psalm 56. If you want to turn with me and follow along in your Bibles, we'll be in Psalm 56. You know, if you get a chance later this afternoon or sometime this week, look up this psalm, Psalm 56, in your Bible at home. You know, the 56th Psalm has somewhat of an interesting subscription, to say the least. Uh, in some of your Bibles, you'll notice just over verse 1 of this particular psalm, we can gather that it was addressed to the chief musician. But then it says these words. It says, Upon Jonath Elam Rekokum. Now, most commentators agree that this is the title of this particular psalm. And it's been translated as the silent dove in distant places. Another thing that we find interesting about this subscription over verse 1 is the fact that we see the words, a mitchtum of David. In fact, this is one of five psalms that are identified as such in the Bible. Now, that word mitchtum literally means to cut or engrave. You see, the thought that David was trying to establish in the mind of the chief musician <coughs> when he penned this uh, particular psalm was the fact that he wanted this to be a permanent writing. And, of course, we know that God must have agreed because it has been eternally preserved within the pages of the Word of God. What an encouragement these verses of Scripture are as we read of God's protecting hand on David's life. Let's read together Psalm 56, beginning in verse number 1. Be merciful, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together. They hide. They mark my steps when they lie in wait for my life. Shall they escape by iniquity? In anger, cast down the peoples, O God. You number my wanderings. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. In God... I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. <laughs> In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? You know, there was a story about a, a minister who was building a wooden trellis to support a climbing vine. And as he was pounding away, he noticed that there was a little boy watching him. Now, the youngster didn't say a word, so the preacher just kept on working, thinking that the little fellow would eventually get bored and leave. But he didn't. 
Pleased at the thought that his work was being admired, the pastor finally said, Well, son, trying to pick up some pointers on gardening? And the little fellow piped up and said, No, I'm just waiting to hear what a preacher man says when he hits his thumb with his hammer. You know, the world is a lot like that little boy. It watches how we, as the children of God, act when we are faced with suffering, injustice, and unfairness. You know, the world expects to see anger and resentment and bitterness and rage, but that's not what the world wants to see. The world wants to see people who can face difficulties in life with grace and inner strength and thus give them hope for their own struggles. Too often we fail, and far too often I fail, to live up to the potential that God has placed within us to meet those challenges. And yet, God understands. That's why he's given us the example of David. Psalm 56 is a portrait of David as a victim. He's been attacked, slandered, conspired against, and yet this psalm is a psalm of praise and adoration. It's a reaffirmation of God's faithfulness. Now, where was David? He was being hounded by his enemies, the Philistines. This particular story refers back to the incident that's recorded for us in 1 Samuel chapter 21. You know, David's life has become one of continuous change up to this point. He started his life as shepherding uh, a, a group of sheep, and we see him anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Israel. We then read where David faced and killed the giant Goliath, and he ended up being a hero of the people because of his success at the war. And so uh, David became a popular figure. In fact, they begin to write songs about him. And they begin singing a little ditty that made its way around Israel. And it says something like, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. Do wah, do wah, do wah. Now that little ditty became a hit song in Israel. I mean, if they had radio in those days, this song would have been the number one hit song of the day. However, the Philistines didn't like that song, and King Saul absolutely hated it. David's popularity among his fellow Israelites created a jealousy within King Saul that resulted in several attempts being made on his life. And finally, David is on the run from Saul, and he sought food and weapons. Primarily, the weapon that he got was the sword of Goliath, and he had taken those from the tabernacle, and he has run for shelter to the Philistine city of Gath. And that's the one place David doubts that Saul would follow. Now, if Gath sounds a little bit familiar to you, it was actually Goliath's hometown. Do you get the irony here? <laughs> David kills Goliath, which makes Saul insanely jealous. And David is forced to run and hide of all places in Goliath's hometown. And on top of that, David is lugging around that sword that everybody in Gath knew it was Goliath's sword. The king of Gath had put David under arrest and was under pressure from his advisors to just put him to death. After all, 
This was the man that killed Goliath several years earlier. And what an opportunity for the Philistines here to do away with David altogether. So let's read just a little bit of what happens in Gath. In 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 10, Then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. And then Achish said to his servants, Look, you see this fella is insane. Why have you even brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that you have brought this fella to play in the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? And then in the next chapter, David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Agilom. And so when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Now when you study your Bible, I believe that you'll find that this 56th Psalm is actually a twin psalm to the 34th psalm that David, uh, God used David to pen as well. The 34th psalm seems to have been written after David's escape from the Philistine king. However, the 56th psalm seems to have been written while David was still in Gath. He was being held as prisoner in enemy hands. Of course, this 56th psalm stands in shoulder to shoulder with the preceding psalm, Psalm 55, where we read of David's troubles being caused by his family and friends. But here in the 56th psalm, David's troubles are being caused by his foes. And my, what trouble David was facing here. In my imagination, I can see David under lock and key in Gath. He's a prisoner in a foreign land, the home of the hated foes of his own people. His life at this point hangs in the balance. No doubt, outside of this, his cell, the triumphant troops of the Philistines, they're marching up and down, They're gloating over their capture of the slayer of Goliath. Some of those Philistine soldiers had lost brothers or sons or friends in that battle that had ensued at Elah after David had killed Goliath. And now they have David in their hands. So what is David to do now? At this point, he had nowhere to go but to the Lord. He had nowhere else to turn but to the Lord. What happened when David reached Gath? Well, a couple of things that I don't think he counted on. First of all, being recognized. You know, Goliath had been from Gath, and David now had that giant sword in his possession. And the second thing And his reputation would precede him. David didn't realize that his reputation would precede him. The Philistines knew all about that song that once praised his prowess. And so David has jumped out of the frying pan into the fire. And the place of refuge was now his prison. Now he sits alone imprisoned within his circumstances without hope and facing a real danger of execution. 
I can kind of sense the seeds of anger in Psalm 56. I mean, if you look at the first couple verses, and also in verses 5 and 6, David is complaining. And within his words, you can hear just a, a slight echo of, it's not fair. It's not right. I don't deserve this. Randy Becton was a man who had arrived, but his world became shattered in 1970 when he learned that his mother had cancer. He said, my mother was only 56 years old, or 50 years old. She was a beautiful, extremely active, healthy woman. She was the hub of our family. My father, my older brother, my two younger sisters, and I, we depended on her intellectual, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual strength. She was the organizing spirit behind every aspect of our family. We thought of her as indispensable and indestructible, and we were wrong. Mother was to have immediate surgery, followed by extensive radiation treatments over the next few months. He said, I flew to Nashville to be with her for the surgery. And as she lay in that recovery room, I sat in the hospital's medical library reading details about this ugly reality called cancer. And that period of study, and though it is seared in my memory, I felt personally violated, assaulted, invaded by this strange thing called cancer. I resented it. I became incredibly angry. She doesn't deserve this, I thought. It just isn't fair. I thought about the events of her life. She's had so many discouragements. God, it's wrong for you to let this happen to her. You know, when we get confronted by individuals or illness, circumstances can sometimes bring us to our knees. And as believers, What we need to see is that though we may be imprisoned, we don't have to be beaten. The key is to be found in how David responds to this situation. What does he do? He sings. He creates a new song. He worships. Just like Paul and Silas in a prison in the book of Acts. When life is darkest, We need to worship. We need to seek God out. Now, what can be the results of David's kind of worship? The first result is David experienced no fear. He said in Psalm 56, verse 10, In God I will praise his word. In the Lord I will praise his word. Notice that phrase, I will praise his word. Verse 11, in God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? You know, Helen Keller, who is a classic example of handling life's problems, she said, I thank God for my handicaps, for through them I found myself, my work, and my God. The second result we see here, David received the encouragement. You know, when Christians are discouraged, what the book of the what book of the Bible do they usually turn to? Psalms. Why? Because God placed that book right in the middle of the Bible to be the source of encouragement as it often is to his people. When you need hope, Psalms is your go-to book. The third result is we can lead others to salvation. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul writes in verse 24, But if all prophesy, 
and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his hearts are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. In other words, when we worship in the way we ought to, believers are struck by the power of God and the weakness of our own lives. And they begin to want the type of God that you and I have. Worship, when it's done right, brings others to Christ who has helped us. Now, pretty much everything that I have said thus so far has been an introduction. These verses of Scripture before us today teach us that when the Lord was all that David had, the Lord was all that David needed. So let's go back in verses 1 through 4 of this psalm. David declares some truths. And the first truth is, God is merciful. God is merciful. Now we not only see evidence of David's foes in verses 1 and 2, but we also see evidence of David's faith in verses 3 and 4. And while considering those things, we certainly can gather along with a psalm that David or that God is merciful. In verses 12 and 13, David declares a second truth. That is, God is mighty. And that thought not only made David happy in his soul in verse 12, but it also made David heedful of his steps. And again, while considering those truths, we must certainly, we can gather that God is mighty. I also want to call your attention to verses 5 through 11 of this psalm, where David declares the third truth, God is mindful. You know, the Lord was not only mindful of David's trust in verses 10 and 11, but the Lord was not only mindful of David's trials in verses 5, 6, and 7, but the Lord was also mindful of David's tears in verses 8 and 9. In fact, notice again, if you would, what David had to say about his tears in verses 8 and 9. He said, you number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? Aren't you glad that God is keeping a record of every tear that falls from the tear ducts of his children's eyes? And David testified personally to that fact. Verse 9, when I cry out to you, when my enemies will turn back. Well, how do you know that, David? How do you know that your enemies are going to turn back? Well, look how David answers. This I know because God is for me. You know, David was in essence saying, I know that my enemies are going to be turned back. I know that God is going to give me victories over my enemies. I know that God is going to give me victory over my trouble and my trials. Why? Because God is for me. And David was simply saying this, and this is the fourth truth. God is on my side. You know, when it seems like everything is going wrong, God is for me. When it seems like my friends are few and far between, God is for me. When the valleys seem to outnumber the mountaintops, God is for me. Do you want to know what kept David smiling in the midst of that Philistine dungeon? 
when it seemed like everything was going wrong. It was the fact that he knew that God was for him. God was on his side. That's why he spoke of praising the Lord in verses 10 and 12. That's why David said in verse 11, In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? That's why that even though David was facing death and destruction at this point in his life, in spite that he still spoke of walking before God in the light of the living in verse 13, it was because that David could say, and this is actually a fifth truth, God is for me. Now, I want to camp out for just a few minutes this morning on this thought. God is for me. Now, I don't know about you, but I rejoice in the fact that I serve the same great God that David served when he penned this song. The same God who encouraged David was the same God who strengthened David. And he was the same God who eventually delivered David from the hands of the Philistine. And I want you to know today that this same God is still just as powerful and still just as wonderful and all-knowing and all-sufficient as he was when David penned this 56th Psalm while sitting in a Philistine prison. If we were to ask David here in this Psalm, David, how do you know that when you cry unto the Lord that the Lord will make your enemies turn back? How do you know that your prayers are not in vain? How do you know, David, that God's going to bring you through this dark, deep valley? And I believe that David would answer just like he did in verse 9. I tell you how I know. I tell you how I know that my God will turn my enemies back and that God will answer my prayer and that God will bring me through this deep, dark valley because God is for me. God is on my side. God is for me. And if God be for me, then who in the world can be against me? David testified to that fact right here in this psalm. God is for me. You know, I believe with all of my heart today that if you are a child of God, God wants you to know that he is for you. Why do some of us think that God has forgotten about us or that he's out to get you? So many folks think that God follows you around and he's just waiting for you to goof up or mess up. And then when you do stumble, he grins and says, gotcha. (laughs) Or, you know, we're thinking he's like Santa Claus. He's making a list, checking it twice. Got to find out who's naughty or nice. God is for you. He's on your side. He is not your enemy. He's there to drive your enemies away. God is on your side. And he's never made a mistake in your life. He knows what he's doing. He cares about your needs. And he's going to take care of it because God is for you. You know, folks, this ought to make you want to jump up and shout, Amen, Hallelujah, just to know that God is for me, just to know that God is on my side, just to know that God cares. And yet, in spite of all of my shortcomings, in spite of all of my weaknesses, in spite of all my failures, God is for me. Now you may be asking the question, well preacher, how do you know God is for you? Have you got any proof that God is on your side? Oh yeah, we have the proof of the scriptures first first of all and most importantly, but I have proof of the saints themselves. 
Let me talk about some of the proofs of how I know. Proof number one, I know that God is for me because he was willing to make me a child of the king. He was able to make me a child of the king, but the Lord was also willing to make me a child of the king. You know why? Because God is for me. He was willing to leave the portals of glory and come down to a sin-cursed earth and take on the form of human flesh in order to make me a child of the king. You see, he paid the price so that he could adopt me into his family. In fact, he laid down his very life in order to make me a child of the king. Now, I may not look like it this morning, but did you know I'm royalty? I once read that the late Dr. Billy Graham was conferred to the, royal, the honor of royal knighthood by the late Queen of England. That's why nothing, and I'm thinking, you know what, that's nothing. I rank higher than the knight of the queen. I'm a child of the king. And if you are a believer, you are royalty too. That's why I know that God is for me, because he was willing to make me a child of the king. First John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I know that God is for me because he was willing to make me a child of the king. Look at the second proof. Proof number two. I know that God is for me because he is working to mold me in his image. You know, I, when you study your Bible, you may see the Lord in many different lights. John 14, you may see him as the way, the truth, and the life. In John chapter 8, he's seen as the light of the world. In John chapter 6, Jesus is seen as the bread of life. But in Jeremiah chapter 18, the Lord is seen as a potter. You know, he's a potter that takes a piece of clay. And even though that clay is marred and useless at first, as the potter makes the clay and begins to mold that clay, he eventually, through his tireless hours of molding, and making that clay turns that worthless mud into a piece of beauty. God said through the pen of Jeremiah, verse 1, the word came, which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made, was made of clay, was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. You know, as you study about the life and the labors of the potter in the word of God, you'll find that the potter not only finds the clay, the potter not only fires the clay, but it's the potter that fashions the clay. You see, where most of us would have just seen a piece of worthless mud, the potter looks beyond the initial appearance of the clay 
and sees the clay's potential. And because of that, the potter picks the clay up and begins to mold it and begins to make it as he sees fit to make. You want to know how I know that God is, is for me? I know because the Lord is working to mold me into his glorious image. Every day, moment by moment, he's molding me and making me into a vessel that he can be pleased with and that he could use. You know, you think about that next time, fellow believer, when things happen in your life that you, you don't understand. The clay never questions the potter. Neither does the potter question the potter's... Uh, the clay doesn't question the potter's motive. That clay is completely submissive and pliable to the potter's hand. And that's how we ought to be in the child of God. The thing we need to remember is God is for you. God is on your side. And that's a great thing to know. You can't always say that about your friends. You can always say that about your brothers and sisters in Christ. But there'll never be a time when you cannot say that about the Lord. God is for me. You know, if you live long enough, you're going to experience heartache, disappointment, and sheer helplessness. The Lord is our most precious resource in those hours of trauma. Just remember this, the Lord is for me. And that you can be assured the Lord is for you as well. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning. God, we thank you for this time together. Lord, I ask that today you would just be with us and help us. Lord, apply this message to our hearts. Help us be encouraged by the fact that God is is for us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, let me just say next week we'll be continuing with our series out of the book of Psalms. On Wednesday, June the 19th, we begin a brand new Bible study out of the book of Genesis. I hope that you can join us June the 19th, 10.30 a.m. live on Facebook. Thanks again. We ask, may God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.